Um, so thank you so much for coming out this morning, um, and I hope you're enjoying the nice uh, coffee and, and sugary sweets. Um, I, I do like those in the morning myself as well. Uh, so we have a great panel tonight. It's a wonderful follow-up to last night's uh, keynote address on the politicization of climate change. For those of you who weren't able to attend, we did record it. Um, and it was really, really a wonderful um, panel of experts. And so I highly encourage you to review that at some point, I'm assuming after your own your finals are over. Um, but, and so today we're talking about the solutions to climate change and how um, we're able to find ways to uh, tackle these problems in um, careers. Uh, and all of these careers are in the Philadelphia area, um, but there are obviously many more opportunities around the world if you don't want to stay in this wonderful city after you graduate. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to introduce our speakers really briefly, um, and then they're going to kind of talk about how they have incorporated sustainability into their career. And then the majority of this will just be Q&A. Um, and so get your questions ready. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, Rob Fleming, who is the founding director of the Masters of Science and Sustainable, and, uh, Sustainable Design Program, sorry, um, at Philadelphia University. And is also an author of a book, which I thought was kind of notable, or definitely notable, um, called Design Education for a Sustainable Future. So that's wonderful. Um, and next we have Joanne Garvin, who is the founder and knowledge leader for No E, as well as the vice president for product management at Arcuity. How do you say? Arcuity. Arcuity. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, she's on the board of directors for the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia. Um, Joanne is also a Villanova alum. Or, yeah, yeah. Like, we always like to make that connection. <laughs> and following her is Adam, who is also a Villanova alum and an alum of Rob's program. So it's really full circle here today. Um, and he's the energy manager for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, next we have uh, David Masur, who is the uh, executive director for Penn Environment, which is a wonderful organization um, here in Pennsylvania. And then last but certainly not least, we have uh, Brenda Cotanda, who is a partner at Menko Gold Catcher and Fox LLP. Try saying that five times fast. Uh, and that's an environmental and energy law firm. Um, she also serves as the board of directors on the Delaware Valley Green Building Council and is a partner, uh, and also on the board of directors for the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. So, a great panel. And we're going to let them tell us all about them. All right. Sorry, and I apologize. I don't know how I'm going to turn off my texting to this, so just ignore the texts that apparently are popping up on my screen right now. That's funny. Yeah. A little funny. So you just, you're going to slide? All right, welcome. So, so glad to be here. I'm going to start with some actual quotes from actual people. 1964, never trust anyone over 30. Raise your hand if you're under 30. Good. A lot of hope there. 1997, the internet is too slow. It will never catch on. 1998, a web page. What do I need a web page for? 1999, email. I don't need it. I have a phone, fax, and FedEx. Partner of a 200 person architecture firm in Philadelphia. 2000, sustainability. I don't see that ever taking off. 2002, green buildings will never work. They are too expensive. 2003, green buildings will never work. They are too expensive. 2004, green buildings will never work. They are too expensive. 2005, a series of events occurred that sh reshaped the way we think about ourselves and the natural world. While there's no real proof that Hurricane Katrina was the result of climate change, people began to make that connection. The tsunami came right after that, had nothing to do with climate change, but it showed how powerful the natural world really is. Gas prices hit four and five dollars a gallon in the U.S. <laughs> and Al Gore put out his controversial book and movie, Inconvenient Truth. 2008, the Great Recession. That's an oxymoron, by the way. And, uh, you know, green buildings were still being built in the middle of a very bad recession, very hopeful. And in 2010, of course, the BP oil spill made us think about our oil as a mile out to sea and a mile down to get oil that we used to get in a very simple and easy way. So the threats and risks of finding reserves are going up every year. The, the sad part about the nuclear plant, in addition to all the destruction, is I always view nuclear as a transitional energy source to renewables. And now, of course, you all know Germany has ceased its nuclear uh, plans for the future. 2012 record drought in the U.S., mostly in the West. 
2012 Hurricane Sandy, and Adam and I were just talking. You know, when sea level rises, it rises very gently, and then it surges. So everybody makes those jokes about beachfront property and how climate change is going to make their... They shouldn't do that, really. <laughs> 2013, Cyclone Phelan. 2013, Super Typhoon Haiyan. In 2014, the summer has been so hot in Australia, they've added new colors to their temperature maps. They have, they have temperatures they've never seen before. And then, of course, in 2014, we have all the record uh, wildflowers in uh, California. So I'm an architect. I talk to architects all the time. And here are some of the quotes I hear from them. Given this context, I hear, we believe in sustainability. We're just waiting for the right client. You see the problem there? 2014, we can't pursue sustainability. No one knows what the word means. I think it's actually pretty, pretty well defined. 2014, we met Lee. What more do we need to do? And those of you who know LEED, that's a green building rating system, which is pretty effective, but doesn't get to the levels that I think we're going to need to get to, given the context that we're facing. So the, oh, you won't be able to see that one. That's okay. So the problem that we have right now is that we are all patting ourselves on the back, saying that we've done a good job. We've designed a building that saves 15% of energy. We have a LEED silver plaque on our building, and we run around and, and put out press releases of how great we are. The panel is going to tell you over today that that's, probably not going to really be enough for where we need to go. We need to go beyond green and move to stop putting our green lipstick on in the morning. Forgot that one was there. <laughs> and so this is the diffusion of technology curve by Rogers adopted for sustainability. So on the far right, you see the laggards. These are people who will never change. Then you have the late majority. These are people that design buildings to meet code. Nobody puts out a press release that says we're going to meet code. Right? Basically, you're just staying out of jail. As we move further to the left, our goal is to jump over the razor's edge. And I'm hoping that one day, 100 years from now, it'll be named after me. So if you could help <laughs> with that, um, that would be really good. And so we're going to move from this green idea, which is purely mitigating waste. It's reducing the overall destruction that we're doing to becoming a sustainable or even a regenerative society. And so at Philly U, when we started our master's degree, we said, hmm, we can't really do the master's degrees we've been doing for the last thousand years. We have to build something new that would make the old models obsolete. I do not show this to my colleagues at Philly U, obviously, because we're designing a new degree that might make their degree obsolete. And of course, every sustainability person seems compelled to show the Einstein quote. You're probably all tired of it, but it really actually is relevant to what we do at Philly U, which is to try to come up with some new models. So I don't know if you can see that in the back, but we decided to use an expanding spiral as the model for our curriculum. Rather than starting at the beginning and ending at the end, we start in the middle and we build a, an expanding spiral of consciousness that moves forward. Anybody can come to our program from any degree, any undergraduate degree. We really don't care. We know that everybody shapes the built environment in different ways. And finally, ethics and why we do what we do. We don't spend enough time talking about why, well, maybe in sustainability programs we do, but regular programs really have to dig down deep into why are we doing what we're doing? Why is it important? How are we doing it? And what will we have in the end? It's really critical. So what I've been arguing with my students is that sustainability is the resolution between free market and also empathy and altruism, government intervention. And that's really the only way it's probably going to happen. So as we move towards 2054, I've actually set the goal now for us that in 2054, <laughs> we're going to go over the razor's edge and reach this level of what we might consider to be a sustainable future. Oh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to have a slide for all of you guys, so you can just speak into this. Or if you want to come up, you can come up. I'll just stand, actually. I'm quite right. loud. Right. <laughs> well, the, for the recording, we need you to speak into one of the microphones. Awesome. Awesome. I like your slide. Thank you. I'm glad I didn't try. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen them all before. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> do you mind if I go first? I, I never do all of those things. Um, so I'm Joanne Garden, <coughs> and class of 98. And um, so I'm a mechanical engineer out of Villanova. And when I started, I was an energy engineer. And there was no such thing as a sustainability industry. Uh, we were efficiency people. And the efficiency industry has been around 60s, 70s on. So I actually joined another Villanova grad uh, who had started a, an energy company, an energy consulting company in Philadelphia. Um, former basketball player, actually, Joe Turk. So, and we connected. 
By the way, use your Villanova connections. I connected with Turk because I was the mascot here. He was on the basketball team. Here. <laughs> Our whole first interview was Villanova basketball. <laughs> it was great. Um, but as you can see, I got a couple things going on now. So um, the No E is actually my company. I founded it in 2012. Um, it's not the first company I've started. It's a tech company. Um, we try to bring to, to market products that help encourage sustainable business practices. Right now, we're actually working on a financial application that helps everyday people invest with their values. Um, so that's one little thing. Uh, the Air Acuity is a tech company in Boston, and they've brought me in just recently, about six months. I'm the VP of product there, so I'm helping them figure out how to design and build smart building systems to better utilize energy for ventilation purposes. Um, so that's a really propeller head, in the weeds kind of version of sustainability. Um, sustainable Business Network, what we do is for small and medium-sized private-owned Philadelphia-based companies, uh, or greater Philadelphia-based companies, we're really their network to help them work together, to provide them information and expertise, give them tools. Um, we have all kinds of ambitious goals that are listed on our website, but the main thing is just to give them a community to exist together and learn from each other. And the, the requirement of being part of SBN is that you're a triple bottom line business. So um, we may partner with some big companies like TV Bank, um, from a, you know, help fund us, help give our members opportunities, but really the members are those people that have embedded sustainability into their business practice. These are all varieties of what sustainability has become in 2015 versus 1998 when it was literally engineers and it was almost exclusively focused on operational efficiency. Um, Liesl's job, honestly, I don't think your job existed in 98. Like that, that role of sustainability director or manager, um, the whole piece of engagement and awareness, um, educational services, that's all stuff that's evolved in the last few years. And to your point, that's why all the disciplines now have a role in sustainability, where it started off very techie, geeky, propeller heads like me. Um, it has now become something that, um, I should back up for one second and say, a big chunk of my career was helping the world's largest corporations create sustainability programs in their companies globally. So you can live in Philly and work worldwide, <coughs> that's number one. Um, I've, I've worked in 125 countries in the last 15 years. Um, and what we did with them is from the corporate structure down, what policies do you need? What compensation models do you need? What are your priorities? How do you fund them? Who needs, you know, what resources do you need to act on them? Energy, waste, water, air emissions, in employee engagement, community involvement, all of those things now are just embedded in sustainability, um, which is cool because one of the things we said um, very early on in the evolution of this discipline back when it was global warming, and then it was climate change, and now it's sustainability. <laughs> it's just, you know, the, the new word of the day. Um, one of the things <coughs> we said very early on was, we don't want it to be something separate. It needs to be just part of business as usual. So that's where um, having all the disciplines come together and knowing what their role is and how they embed that in their professional practice is so critical. Um, and. I think we're much better suited today than we were 15 years ago, for sure, um, to have that come to be, especially because the people coming out of schools now, you guys kind of expect this. Um, I just had this debate with my, my company in Boston yesterday, Air Acuity. We're, we're still kind of a small start tech uh, startup, and one of my requirements on my roadmap going forward is how do we become a B Corp, or at least B Corp certified? How do we become a sustainable business while we grow from startup into full-fledged profitable company? And my, no offense, my six management team partners who are middle-aged white guys were like, what, Wait, what, how will we do that? And I was like, well, if we want to recruit the best people, if we want to be the most profitable, if we want our products to, to do more good than harm, like, and I had to make the business case to them. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done, 
uh, and it takes all the disciplines to do it. And yeah, that's my story. I'm happy to talk about it more. Thank you. Awesome. And you threw in B Corp, which is great. I yeah. I love B corporations. If you've never heard of that before, you should definitely Google it. B Corp. It's great. Uh, all right. Awesome. Okay. You're on this week's slide. Okay. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Adam Galica. Again, I'm the energy manager for the city of Philadelphia. Um, I thought I'd give you just a little bit of framework around our office, and, um, and I work for the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, at least in part, and a little bit of the work we do, and then um, talk a little bit about, bit about uh, climate adaptation and climate mm -hmm. and mitigation and sort of how those fit together. Um, just because I, I know we're, we're all focused on climate, I think it's a, it's a tremendous issue to be focused on and deserves our, a lot of our efforts. So um, just to start, the, the framework for a lot of the work that we're doing in the city of Philadelphia um, and this is a small office, there's about six of us that are working in the, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, is, is really around uh, the Greenworks Philadelphia, the city's sustainability plan. It's got five goal areas, which you're seeing up there. From that, there's 15 um, exact targets. So um, everything from how do we decrease uh, vehicle miles traveled, <coughs> how do we decrease government energy consumption, um, looking at greenhouse gases on, on a city scale, um, looking at local foods and equity issues, um, do Philadelphians have access to park? Do Philadelphians have access to um, local foods, and, um, and it all kind of wraps together to, you know, aspirationally make Philadelphia the greenest city in America. Um, Philadelphia has made a, a tremendous amount of progress in the last uh, eight years in the, in the Nutter administration in this goal. We're hoping, as we're now going through, and there's a there's a mayor's <laughs> election actually in a, in a couple weeks, that we can build on that and um, and continue to make that progress. Um, I'm sure folks have heard about some of the uh, the things that are happening in the Philadelphia region around. Um, particularly related to the Marcellus Shale region and, and Philadelphia as an energy hub and, and there's there's a lot of different paths and a lot of different choices and it should be interesting to see how these next couple of years shake out in, in both the city and in the re region. Um, that said, my focus is really um, a lot of what Joanna was talking about when, uh, in internal operations and trying to make the city as its own operation, as its own entity, um, really use energy efficiently, purchase energy efficiently. Um, and promote projects and try to change practices and policies within that city government construct to, um, to, to, to reduce our costs and reduce our environmental impact. So it, it's really an, an internal focus and, um, and I've been with the city for about five years. As, um, as I was saying, I'm a Villanova grad, mechanical engineering, and went into the Rob's program. Um, a couple of years ago. I don't know if I'm quite a middle-aged white man, but I guess, <laughs> not, you're not. I guess I'm not young <laughs> anymore, so, <laughs> so be You're it. younger than me. <laughs> you don't have a lot of time left. Though, um, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> get, get living. So anyway, um, talking a little bit about climate change, um, one of the things that we've sort of started to focus on is instead of just looking at mitigation, starting to look at well, you know, what happens in Philadelphia when climate impacts hit. So um, the last five or so years, we've had a lot of of interesting weather now. You know, Rob pointed out weather and climate, those are those are different things. We shouldn't necessarily group them together. But um but we are and, and we have to in some extent because we have to recognize that more frequent weather events is going to have more frequent disruptions and we need to be able to plan for that. Um, you know this city has been around I like to say when folks say government is inefficient and I totally agree for <laughs> for a lot of a lot of it, a lot of reasons but um you know for better or for worse the city of Philadelphia has been around for almost four hundred years. Um, that's longer than the U.S. government. That's longer than really almost every major corporation out there. So you know, it's it's still chugging along <laughs> for better or for worse, and it will continue to chug along. And so we need to be able to be prepared as much as possible. The, the planning work that we're doing, I think, is as important as a lot of the implementation work because it's 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 forward looking, and, and so often we're just reacting. And um, and getting out of those reactive cycles is really an important part of kind of efficient government in that sense. So. With all that said, what we're looking at is, is, is city assets and looking at, okay, we've got increased weather coming in. What is the, what's the vulnerabilities from these? Um, if we've got more frequent flooding, if we've got more frequent um, heat waves, um, how is that going to both impact the city infrastructure, whether it be roads or city buildings or, or the social infrastructure? Um, if we've got more heat waves, maybe there's additional need for health centers uh, or cooling centers. And, and do we have those in the right places? And, um, and can we make sure that we're they're really thinking about this cohesively so that we're not just reacting in the future um, and when, it, when a storm hits, because a storm will hit. Um, we, have a, we have a plan in place and we've got the infrastructure in place 
to be able to, to be prepared for that. So um, just a couple of things I wanted to, to sort of point out within this, this construct. So I'm focused almost exclusively on Philadelphia in my work. Um, but, but obviously there's a whole big world out there. Um, when you look at Philadelphia, and this is the, basically a five feet sea level rise, so I would say it's about a two meter rise um, if you know, things don't change drastically. Um, so we're looking at a couple of the cities. In Philadelphia, only about 1% of the city is flooded, mostly down in the southwest area near the, the airport. So that's where we're specifically looking at our, 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 our assets. But um, as Rob was saying, as we were discussing earlier, um, you know, the flooding can really, and the storm surge can really change that <coughs> dramatically. So relatively, we're, we're relatively safe in, in a lot of these scenarios. Um, but as we're looking forward, um, we're looking, okay, well, what happens, um, what happens in Philadelphia specifically? And we've done some climate models and really started to look through, um, how's that going to impact? So this is a little bit of a confusing graph, and I recognize that, and I'm not going to try to explain it exactly, but what I'm going to say is that we've run, um, that this is showing four different climate models. Um, each of the colors is a different model. Um, basically, the, the bottom left is the observed. That's where, we're, we are, where we are today in terms of our um, annual participation and our annual mean temperature. Um, what's on the right when you've got the open circles, that's what the models are showing under different emission scenarios as to what our average mean temperature is going to be and what our average rainfall. So generally, um, our projections are it's going to be hotter, it's going to be wetter. Um, we're also going to have more frequent cold streaks. Um, it's, it's a really uh, a, a complex kind of future that we're, we're looking at and a complex future that we're trying to plan for. So um, uh, just in kind of closing with that, you know, a lot of this is falling within that adaptation work. We're also still doing a lot of work for mitigation, a lot of work to sort of make sure that we don't see some of those climate scenarios. Um, and, and there's a lot of room in the middle. Um, there's a lot of places where if you're planting trees, that's going to absorb more stormwater. Um, that's both going to mitigate climate change and it's going to adapt as we get more frequent rainfall. So um, uh, this is all the work that I'm kind of working on and our office is doing, and uh, we hope to continue to do that and happy to uh, answer some questions as we uh, move forward. I just want to say that today is the first day for the new bike share program in yes. the city of Philadelphia. Which is also a big thanks to your colleagues. So um, yeah, I didn't do anything here, on that, but. Uh, <laughs> over the next couple of weeks, you want to go, you know, wander around Phil, you should definitely check out the new bike share. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am really late, but yeah, me too. when I get stuck somewhere, it's really awesome. Uh, thank you. My name is David Mazur, and I'm the executive director for a citizen-based nonprofit group, Penn Environment. Uh, Penn Environment works specifically on the issue of climate change, uh, predominantly through policy change. Essentially, I think you've heard from all the speakers so far, and Brenda followed that, uh, there's a lot going on to try and tackle the issue of climate change. Rob made the great point that uh, we have the tools at our fingertips today to uh, make a huge dent in the issue of uh, how we affect our climate. We can have green building technology. We have enough clean energy to supply the country. If that's solar, uh, offshore wind, wind in the plain states. Uh, we have cities and local officials who are doing everything they can to make sure that uh, they're using their power to tack tackle climate change. And uh, if you're like me or Joanne, uh, you know, we took the train in this morning, uh, actually all three of us from Philly, mm -hmm. uh, we're doing our part and you're probably doing your part every day to try and tackle climate change as well and reduce your carbon footprint. But at Penn Environment, we believe strongly that to tackle this very profound problem, it's going to require institutionalized change at the largest level and policy change to make sure that uh, we avoid the worst effects of climate change. And I think this also gets part, partly back to Rob's overview that while we're all doing our part, unfortunately, there are a number of powerful interests who have a financially vested outcome in keeping the status quo, uh, who are doing everything they can uh, to slow down efforts to tackle climate change. So while all of us are here sitting in the room, I guarantee you that there are lobbyists on the hill of uh, the Capitol in Washington, DC, lobbyists in the state capitol at Harrisburg, uh, trying to do everything they can to convince politicians to keep dragging their feet. Uh, they're spending millions of dollars on ad campaigns to try and confuse and sway the public. And so the role that Penn Environment has is that in our democratic process, we want to galvanize the public support for pressing issues like tackling climate change and engage the public 
Uh, we may not be able to compete with the biggest climate change polluters dollar for dollar, but we think that the public is with us. People want to tackle climate change, so our job is uh, mobilizing that support and bringing that voice to elected officials who can then implement that institutionalized policy change. Uh, and I think we're at a really um, historic moment. If you haven't been following what's happening uh, both in Washington, D.C. and in Harrisburg, uh, we're at an incredible uh, crossroads on, on the policy efforts to tackle climate change. This uh, panel is about the solution, so um, hopefully this will help you feel a little better since climate change can be somewhat depressing. Uh, as you may know, at the federal level right now, uh, President Obama's EPA has proposed what's called the Clean Power Plan. It will tackle climate change from the single largest source in America, which is coal-fired power plants, and make massive reductions. Uh, this has broad support from the public. It has support even from many utility companies that burn coal and realize there are better ways moving forward but still faces a lot of opposition from the coal industry uh, and certain sectors of the <coughs> energy um, lobby in Harrisburg and, and in D.C. But this will be undoubtedly uh, the largest step we have taken as a nation when finalized to tackle climate change. And you're at an important moment in time because uh, it looks like the EPA will finalize this rule late this summer uh, and send it to Congress for final uh, approval. So that's one uh, exciting solution we have at hand. Uh, secondly, if you follow state politics, we've had a big change. Uh, we've switched governors in January. As you may know, our previous governor uh, didn't really believe in the science of climate and said so over and over again. Uh, Tom Wolf has come in as the new governor. He surrounded himself with environmental leaders, past uh, secretaries at the Department of Environmental Protection, and is already moving forward with a whole set of proposals to make sure that the Commonwealth is doing everything we can on the policy side to be clean and green when it comes to climate change, promoting clean energy and a statewide climate plan. Uh, so there are a number of things happening right now, but again, uh, the big piece that Penn Environment pushes is uh, to make sure our decision makers do the right thing. They need to hear from folks like you and I, obviously, through the democratic process to make that happen. Um, a couple of quick things, I've set out postcards. If you're looking to do a quick Earth Day action, one of the simplest things is to sign a postcard which we'll deliver to Senator Casey, telling him to support the Clean Power Plan federally. Uh, and I also put a sign-up sheet at the back of the room. Our staff are in the halls of uh, Congress and the state legislature every day, and so can get you updates on the policy changes taking place around climate change and other environmental <coughs> issues. And so if you want to know what's happening and how you can best take action through the democratic pr uh, process, uh, I hope you'll sign up uh, so that you can join our network of about 100,000 Pennsylvanians who uh, get updates and stay involved with Penn Environment's work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Do no, you want to say a few no, words? No, <laughs> nope, I'm good. Hi, I'm Brenda Gotonda, as Lisa has said, and I am a partner with the environmental and energy law firm of Mango Gold, Catcher, and Fox, with approximately 30 attorneys and two in-house technical consultants. We are um, the largest environmental law firm practice group in the region. We uh, sustainability is a very important component of both our professional practice as well as our firm culture. Um, and we take pride in not only trying to provide the highest quality legal services, but also acting as responsible stewards for the environment when we um, conduct our practice. So Liesl had asked us to talk a little bit about what we do in our work and in our personal life to combat climate change. And so as I thought about that a little bit, I thought about the things that I've been doing um, to develop and to promote and to implement sustainable solutions and thought that that might be helpful to the conversation today as you all sit there thinking about well, what career do I want to go into and is this career something that would be amenable to my making a difference. So I'm an environmental lawyer. I represent a, a broad range of clients but in, have found ways within that practice and my personal life to promote these sustainable solutions. So I've thought of three things in my work that I'd like to speak with you and three things in my personal life that I'd like to mention and discuss with you. In my work, um, I have over 20 years of practice as an environmental lawyer. 
So I spend my days counseling clients on uh, complex environmental regulatory programs, assisting them with permitting, uh, working on cleanups, sort of brownfield remediation where there's been contamination, taking old industrial sites, making them usable again. And this is a lot of what I have been doing over the years. And, and in some regard, we are working with clients to reduce their negative impacts. This is something that Rob had touched on reduce their negative impacts and quite frankly the risk to their business and increase the positive environmental impacts in what we do and in fact that increases their business value. Um, and so as I said I have a broad range of clients, some that are working hard to achieve and maintain compliance with complex environmental regulatory programs and others that are going way beyond that with voluntary sustainability initiatives that they are implementing into their core business operations. So I represent clients from uh, industrial and chemical manufacturers to retail, develop retail clients to developers, um, transportation, railroads, academic institutions, camps, municipalities, so really the, the full spectrum. Everybody is touched by the environment, everybody is touching the environment and needs to understand what impact they're making and how to reduce those impacts and so we help them with that. Um, a lot of my practice involves the protection of water resources, both quantity and quality. A lot of uh, businesses will have water discharges, so thinking about how much water you're using and <coughs> how you're impacting it. Uh, as I said, cleaning up contaminated sites, working on uh, waste management and recycling. Folks that may be generating <coughs> hazardous waste in their production process, thinking about how not to generate hazardous waste because there's negative impacts and quite frankly risk to that business. So trying to rethink what they do. Um, in addition, uh, working through issues related to green building, folks that are trying to build in ways that have more positive impacts, less negative impacts, green claims and marketing, sustainability, energy, energy efficiency, so a, a broad range of things. So that's a little bit about what I do in my professional work. In addition, um, wanted to mention we have uh, developed a sustainability directors roundtable about four or five years ago and a lot of sustainability directors and managers from large corporations really trying to feel their way and think about how to implement sustainable solutions throughout large organizations um, so formed this group to bring them together so that they could talk with their peers about some of the challenges that they're facing some of the successful ways they've found to overcome the challenges and really have cross-sector networking and education. And we have about 50 organizations participating. They get together on uh, three or four times a year and talk to one another about what it is that they are doing. And we find that there's a lot of value in kind of cross-sector communication. So. We will have programming, for example. Um, one of the recent programs was on supply chain, and we had Blommer Chocolate come in and talk to the group about how they handle supply chain management in the cocoa industry. So they are North America's largest cocoa processor and material ingredient supplier. So all of the chocolate that you see on the supermarket shelves and on the fancy store shelves, they're all using cocoa that has been processed by Blommer. So Blommer is reaching back um, to the source, to the farmer, to talk to the farmers and train them about how they can have more sustainable operations. We recently went, uh, and Liesl is a member of the round table as a matter of fact, we went to the zoo, learned about um, habitat conservation and some of the things that the zoo is doing around public education. Amtrak, SEPTA talked about transportation. So pretty diverse range of sectors, getting everybody talking together about how what one sector is doing um, you know, might have some value, some thought in other sectors for implementation. Um, and then the third thing that I wanted to mention to you with regard to my work is the sustainability, sustainability practices that my own firm implements. So we have uh, green practices. We try to reduce our own impact. We are a law office, so as you can imagine, we use lots of paper, you know, hosting client meetings, thinking about how we do that, how we can reduce our impact. And this <coughs> serves as a way to engage our clients and to engage the community. In addition, our individual lawyers are very involved in the community. Um, working with conservation and environmental organizations and reaching out to share their knowledge 
with others in both the community locally, like on environmental uh, advisory councils for townships, um, as well as in the bar. We were one of the uh, founding members of the Law Office Climate Change within the American Bar Association. Philadelphia has a green business program, and um, there's a law firm sustainability network. So really trying to get the conversation going within the legal field itself. And one of the things of which I'm most proud, so I want to brag a little bit, is that we recently moved offices and um, were with the new fit out the design and construction, uh, used sustainable design and construction principles so that we could reduce the impact that we would have when we built out our new space and we were able to achieve a gold certification under the LEED rating system and are actually the first law firm in the Philadelphia region to achieve that high level of certification for a build out of an interior space in a building. So we only have uh, about 50 employees, we're not taking up a whole building, just an interior space, but in our space we were able to work with the building owner to help us in ways that they needed in order for us to um, qualify and then build our space um, using sustainable practices so we were able to get LEED certified. Now turning to my personal life, um, I volunteer my time uh, with organizations that are committed to <coughs> enhancing the environment and sustainability. Um, for example, I'm on the board of directors of the Delaware Valley Green Building Council that uh, promotes green building practices and tries to engage folks around green building. Rob was one of the founding members of the DBGBC. It's a wonderful organization, really engaging the community at all levels. Uh, we hosted the International Green Build Conference here a couple of years ago and had 20,000 people come in from all over the world <coughs> to see what we're doing here in the Philadelphia region around sustainability. And I organized and led a tour of sustainable manufacturing sites. So we were very pleased to show off a lot of the achievements that we have um, had here and share it with people from, from other regions. As Liesl mentioned, I'm also on the board of directors for the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. I have a little brochure I brought with it up to me. I'm not sure if folks are aware of that. But that's um, an organization that is designed and um, uh, to enhance the Delaware Estuary and Bay because it's so very important um, you know, for the environment, for the ecology, for all of the business um, operations that, that are located along the Delaware. And they're a science-based collaborative organization. So they're bringing together the environmental regulators and industry and environmental activists to all come together and find ways to um, take action to enhance the estuary. So for example, one of the um, big projects we're working on now is about living shorelines because we're seeing a lot of erosion on shorelines. They're putting up these uh, oyster castles, sort of these little buildings along the shoreline to break the waves and as a nursery for oysters, because oysters and mussels um, are, are critical to cleaning the water. So, you know, doing lots of projects to help the estuary. So I'm, I'm, you know, so happy to be a part of that. I've just recently gotten involved with them. And then the last thing I want to mention in the personal role is I served for many years here in Radnor Township as chair of the Environmental Advisory Council. So we were providing guidance to the, to the local township on environmental and sustainability issues. And we developed a greenhouse gas action plan. First we did emissions inventory and then an action plan. Worked up um, uh, green guidelines for the township to implement, developed a sustainable parks policy, worked with community energy to bring an electric vehicle charging station to Radnor Township. And so there are lots of things we were able to do at the local level. So I thought it might be helpful to share with you some of those things as you think about your careers. You may think, oh, well, this career may not be directly on point with an environmental issue, but there's so many things that you can do within any career. And I think that's what you see here. A lot of people taking their interest in bringing sustainability and environmental conservation. To our wonderful panelists. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not sure if that is. But let's pretend it's not making any noise. Um, we have plenty of time for question and answer um, periods. If you have any questions, great. Um, you would like to ask the panelists, um, now would be time. And for panelists, if you could just use the microphone there, that would be great. <laughs> Not this. Yes. Hi, my name is Lindsay Lopez. I'm a 2L at Bill Um, My question was about something that Joanne Gardner brought up in her presentation, the business as usual concept, which I think 
has been floating around since like 2007. And, um, you know, it's 2015 now, and I'm just wondering about, anyone can chime in about um, any actual, I, I understand that there's been uh, adverse uh, lobbying on Capitol Hill that has probably delayed um, a reduction from the business as usual tax, but uh, how long is it gonna take? <laughs> <laughs> I think, wanna, wanna start? Um. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, uh, one of the big challenges we face through our democratic process is, is getting to the, the piece you're mentioning here, which is, you know, there, there's pretty broad support for uh, from the public for putting our country and uh, our businesses on a path that is sustainable and um, trying to tackle so many of the environmental problems, including climate change, that we face. Uh, I think until we can do a couple of things, one uh, being we have to get the influence of big money and powerful interests out of politics so that our politicians stop dragging their feet and instead of listening to people like you and I who care about the issues, they're listening to lobbyists and they're always looking over their shoulder for the ads running on, um, on TV and who's going to spend money against them in election season and all these things. Um, it, it's this policy and others that you know really get uh, held back, and uh, it's. I think it's sad. I mean, we, the, the country was built on a vision of you know we're hardworking, we are uh, smart, we are visionary, and on some of these issues we're getting log jammed. Um, not because the public isn't with us, not because we don't have the tools at our fingertips, not because everyday citizens are doing their part, but because the places where. Uh, very big decisions are made, and there's some exceptions. So like the city of Philadelphia, cities are doing their part, but it's one and a half million people out of about 13 and a half million people in the Commonwealth, is one example. Um, we need to, to change the system so that instead of, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, uh, instead of it being one dollar, one vote, it should be one person gets one vote, and that's how democracy meant to work. So, so it's a big challenge, but there's some real policy issues. Yeah. I guess I'd like to add, even though we seem to be having a log jam in Washington, that I work with a lot of uh, big businesses every day that are implementing sustainability initiatives. So that's not to say there aren't big businesses out there that are you know, putting their money toward lobbyists that are fighting it. But there are a lot of businesses, particularly international businesses, that are seeing effects around the world um, and really are taking it seriously. And they see sustainability, quite frankly, as a way to ensure the value of their businesses going forward. Because unless they take action, um, you know, it's going to impact them as well. So I want to just add that it's, it's not just individuals that's important, but it's companies that are taking action too. They're not waiting for the government to mandate it. So I'm 20 years into sustainability. I'm right about your contemporary. And I've um, actually never been more optimistic than I am right now. Both of my parents smoke two packs a day of cigarettes. And that's why I'm not as tall as I should be. <laughs> and, um, and why I'm optimistic is there was a huge amount of effort to confuse and make people think that smoking wasn't dangerous. We're seeing the exact same pattern going on right now with climate change. Overall, I have a lot of faith in humanity to read through that and begin to fight through it. And I think we're seeing enough examples here today that the tide is starting to turn, thanks to you guys especially. Um, and the other one is ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. So in 1992, George Bush, Republican, passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which said that people in wheelchairs, among other things, should be able to get into a building and not have to sue, right? So, and that was really fought against by builders and architects especially who thought that the proportions of their buildings might be negatively impacted by ramps and such. So there was a lot of resistance to that. Now ADA is part of everything we do. And I think sustainability has come to rec represent what is the definition of better. <laughs> ADA is better, not smoking is better. Sustainability is now becoming the mantra for what becomes better. And at that point, society moves forward on its own momentum. And I think we're almost there. If you're young right now, you are in, the, in a good spot right now to be in. Because you're gonna have a lot of opportunities to contribute into this future that we're looking at. So I'm going to be an engineer about this answer and say, um, from a time frame, I still think we're decades away from monumental change. Um, 
if we keep doing incremental things. Now the beauty of it is everybody here is working in different directions um, and those things add up. Um, I also think, <coughs> I too work with a lot of big companies in my career. Big companies, everybody loves to hate them, like ah, Walmart, rah. Walmart does so much in our field, I mean they do bad stuff, but they do so much in our field to progress better supply chain management and other things. The drug companies do amazing things on environmental efficiency and energy efficiency. That coupled with community, uh, community ground-based efforts, all of that's starting to accumulate where I think, um, and this is why I started a company to do it, to the, the dollar, one dollar equals one vote thing, uh, the thing that the, the mass public, the other 13 million people in the, in the country don't have right now is the dollar in the game. And that's actually what changes everything. I have never ever gotten a company in my consulting practice to do anything sustainable if it didn't make business sense. We always have to equate it to why this is either gonna make money or save money. So there's a lot of companies in the financial sector now focused on how do we empower every single citizen to invest their dollars in companies that align with their values. So my company is just one of them and we're way back. <laughs> we're just, we're not even in production yet. Um, but there's a really great movement that Ariana Huffington is just, <laughs> and a couple of her peers have started called Just Capital. Um, I would definitely Google and get involved in that um, because they're the people with the money and they're trying to empower people to use their, their, their wallets in a better way. Um, so I would, I think our brightest hope for um, not being decades away is by leveraging the financial marketplace to really cast a vote in what is acceptable business practices and government practices, honestly. Because that's the other thing you should realize is at the highest levels of our government, companies lead the way. Like the, the government's not, it's very hard to regulate. It's much easier for companies to start doing stuff and then the government just comes in and makes it formal. So. Awesome, thank you. Can, can you just sort of follow that? We mentioned the B-Labs and, and what you're talking about I think ties in perfectly with that. Can, can you just sort of explain that a little bit? Because I'm not sure if people know what that is. Sure, I can, I can or, or unless anybody else is like super yeah. expert on it. Yeah, sure. no. <laughs> um, so B-Lab, SBN is actually partners with B-Lab. Um, they're, they're a nonprofit that started um, a third party certification process. It started as a cert <coughs> and it's an assessment that you can go through. It's, it's, there's a lot of different assessments that exist in the world now to help um, embed sustainability practices into your, not just your operations, but your culture and, and all of it from soup to nuts. Um, what B-Lab did was put technology into it. So they made it an online platform. They've made the assessments really easy to get through. They've connected companies together to share best practices. They've put a scoring system on it so that you can get promoted. And they did all the things that you do now with an online um, version. Then they took it one step further and actually created a new type of legal entity called a B corporation. And that's where it gets kind of interesting because you can be um, an LLC, which is what my companies are. We're little, we don't have a lot of paperwork to fill out. Um, but you, if you're a C corp, like a Pfizer, then you have you know stock on the, the stock exchange, you got all these legal requirements, um, you gotta have people, you know, big legal staff to help you. This is just another version of that. This is a B Corp, and what they do is in the formation documents of your company, you say that you will be a benefit to society. And what that does for you is it doesn't matter what CEO comes in, it doesn't matter what board of directors comes in, they can't go against their own formation documents. So it just legally binds them to be a benefit corporation. Um, they've managed to get it established as a legal entity, I think, in about a dozen or 15 states now. Mont, don't fact check me on that. But they're working through the states one by one to get these um, established. Oh, and they're Philly based, I should say. And if I also on their website, they have a job board. So if you want to work for a company that you know is you know, wholeheartedly interested and invested in sustainability, 
Um, but is it necessarily a sustain, you know, it doesn't say sustainability in the title, is what you're studying, you can look at their job board and they always have really great opportunities as well on there. They also have a really cool report that brings together like 30 different research projects by like Deloitte and all kinds of other not green people that shows the business case for sustainability, that companies that embed these practices make more money with less risk. So there's two questions. One was about how in higher ed can you establish these sustainability programs and collaborate across disciplines. The second part was about kids and K through 12. And one of the things that's really interesting that's happening, I know you have sustainable engineering here, we have sustainable design. These are horizontally based degrees. So in the past, we went vertical. If you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be the best engineer possible. I don't see anything fundamentally wrong with that. In fact, if everybody becomes horizontal, we're not going. nobody's going to know anything in terms of the technical details. So the hope is that we have sort of a, I hate to use the word F or E, but we're trying to create this horizontal bar that can unite all of the disciplines together, but then have these depths of expertise. So having Adam in our program, for example, working with architects on a building was really unique because he was really fascinated with the energy, but he understood also that the design itself, the form of the building, the shape of the building, the orientation also had a great impact on that energy. So to, to watch the engineers and architects work together was really exciting. The problem is that we haven't redesigned our higher ed system to engage this kind of learning. So if you go to design studios, the, all the desks are lined up where one student sits in one desk and does their work. So we couldn't even get the desks in a circle to get the students to work at a table. The second thing is the credit structure doesn't work. So faculty fight over number of credits. The payment structure doesn't work. So there's all these structural barriers to doing these kind of horizontal programs. So for the last 10, 15 years, we're just breaking those down. And we're saying, well, why do we have to have a major that has to be in one college within a university, for example? These kind of vertical structures are really hurting our ability to move more further, more quickly, and yet people are doing it. That's what I mean about the human spirit. The desire for curiosity, I know that people want to see these things happen, and they're fighting through that. Um, who can answer the K through 12? Okay. Well, so I'll, I'll answer this just from a little bit of a different angle, having kind of participated in a cross-disciplinary program. And um, I think ultimately your questions are related, they're linked, you know. Um, if we do a better job through from K to 12, um, we don't necessarily need to go back and instill those values into a graduate program, into a graduate structure. Because folks will fundamentally understand the environmental impact, they'll fundamentally understand energy impacts in their decision process. So it becomes a part of that, that, um, that education process. I think ultimately the, the degree I got, the degree that Rob's teaching, you know, we'd all would want that to be kind of obsolete, um, we're trying to we're trying to instill those values and have those. Sorry, Rob. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we're trying to have that be a, a base of kind of value within every student, you know, and and with everybody, so that that you're not making those decisions uh, on solely what you learned in your your mechanical engineering, you know, materials class, because your materials class covered the environmental impacts of the various aspects of various material choices or what, what have you. So I think it um, it is linked, and in terms of how do you start the education younger, um, you know, it's a, that's that's a challenge. I think that it really comes back to a lot of the issues that David was talking about around, um, you know, making sure that that the structure of government is is such that they're supportive of that. And and right now, um, you know, education is a very big issue here in Pennsylvania, a huge issue in Philadelphia. Um, you know, we're dealing with fundamental funding problems. You know, let alone curriculum development and having proper kind of um, I can education. To Just speaking to the uh, K to 12, the Delaware Valley Green Building Council has a green schools program 
where it's actually reaching out to the uh, lower schools to try not only to um, ensure that the places where the children are learning are good, healthy places, they have good air quality, and really taking existing stock of buildings and working with the schools to try to implement you know, greener features to those schools and working with statewide educational associations to um, advance more sustainability into the curriculum. So there are efforts ongoing to push it down into the lower grades. And then there's also outside organizations that are trying to engage the, the children. Uh, Liesl and I were judges at a contest at the Philadelphia Zoo last week where they had asked kids to develop campaigns to link climate change to animal habitat and to rethink recycling. And it was amazing what these K through 12 kids came up with as ways to rethink recycling. Well, that's only one piece. It gets the kids engaged and gets them thinking about it. I mean, some were making parades through their community to engage. Uh, others were writing to their mayor, writing to the folks that were supplying the cafeteria, um, really getting out there, not just sitting in the classroom, you know, coloring in pictures of recycle signs or something. So it's happening from a lot of a lot of different angles. Okay. Maybe I'll add one more thing. Um, I live in South Philly. I have a four and a half year old. He's in daycare right now. This week is Earth Week at daycare. They've been doing environmental stuff all week, which was sort of blowing my mind. You know taking stuff out of the recyclable you know, container and having to build um, objects. And, and so there's a whole movement out there. But um, I guess I'd like to add two things because I think to Rob and Adam's point, um, I'm, I'm very optimistic where people and the public as a whole are in their knowledge, understanding, and support of this. Can we do more and make the systems better to teach sustainability? Yes. I think we now have to make the jump from taking those values and making sure we're um, engaged through the civic process to make sure that our values are implemented in the way we, we'd like. So one example I think of in the city of Philadelphia is recycling. Um, 20 years ago, recycling was sort of an environmental issue. I, I think of it today, and a lot of my neighbors uh, would think of it, it's just part of um, our services we get. It's like you, you put out your trash, uh, the city picks up, you put out your recycling, the city picks it up, it snows, they plow. It's, it's just part of what we do. And the hard part is, as I said, I think every day while we have those values, um, decisions are being made that push against them. Um, folks may not know this, the very first law signed in, in, uh, into law by Tom Corbett, the previous governor, Act One, was to gut the state's green building standards. They basically gutted the entire law of how we implement green building standards. And we no longer implement the federal standards that come down the pike if it's on ADA, as Rob mentioned, or, uh, or efficiency. Um, that happened while all of us are saying we love green buildings and our kids say it and they're being taught that every day. So we, now I think we have to keep building people's education, but they have to realize if you don't, you, use that education to further the cause, we're gonna keep taking step back, step back, and now we're trying to you know, put, put that policy back on the books because we're not using the newest technology uh, to, to do that. So, so I think we have to do both those things, but sometimes I think we get so immersed on the education and assume people don't know when they do, and then we don't focus on where the actual big play is. So in our uh, environmental issues seminar course, we talked about the dangers of greenwashing. So I wanted to know, in industry, do you find that that kind of fosters a sense of complacency? We had a rep from Campbell's Soup Com. And whereas some things, some strides were being made, uh, it was a lot more talk, I think, than actual productivity. And she even admitted you know, she would have to make sure the programs made economic sense. And it was a lot more just her doing paperwork and filing for recommendations, um, you know, but they, because they met some sort of standards they could portray that they were going green, do you think that you know, fosters a sense of complacency? Was that Melissa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa and I are neighbors, our dogs are best friends, <laughs> she used to work for me twice. Um, so, um, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling. <laughs> um, 
Greenwashing is a very interesting thing. Back, I don't know if you would agree with this, but back in the day, it was like everybody did it. And they did it knowingly. Like I had, against my wishes, I had a customer build, um, put a solar farm up on one of their corporate campuses, but it was owned by somebody else and somebody else owned the renewable credits for it. So legally, it, my customer had no right to say they were using solar power. It's as if it didn't exist. But they were like, well, it's a voluntary system, so we can do it. And that was very, very common. Um, even if the best of people would do that stuff. I think it's less common today. There's, um, Liesl, I, no, you brought up, Barbara, yeah. Barbara brought up science-based. Um, one of the things over the last 15, 20 years we're trending away from is the emotional, squishy, hug a polar bear aspects of sustainability. Um, and the reason is because you can win some of the people with that type of approach, but you'll lose a lot of people too, because they're capitalists. Um, and as we become more science-based and more um, systematic in the way we measure things, and um, there's more third-party verification standards where if you're going to say this publicly, either you're going to have to get a stamp of approval from somebody outside your walls, or your peers are going to call you on it. Like, no, 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 that's not true. So that we have a lot more uh, checks and balances than we had 15 years ago. I think what I'm seeing an increase in, though, is unintentional greenwashing. Um, we're in this like adolescent stage of sustainability where back in the day it was all technical people and science-based people, either they're really crappy scientists or they're very methodical and one plus one equals two. Now that we've opened the doors and it's marketing and it's um, finance and it's legal, no offense, Legal has a way of twisting things in different directions. Oh, let me Mark speak to them. <laughs> <laughs> some good, some bad. Um, but as we get these new people, and it's like this adolescent stage where they don't really understand what they're saying. So they say something, they think it means one thing, it actually means another thing, and then everybody's all confused. So I think, but that's, I think it's a growing phase. I think we'll, the science-based aspects of this, the educational-based, the policy-based, all of that's going to course correct. One of the changes that has occurred in recent years is that the Federal Trade Commission has updated its green guide. So it has gone through and looked at and evaluated all of the marketing that is happening, what people are saying about whether they own RECs or solar system or, or um, you know, uh, wind power. They've looked at the green things that are the focus of marketing and they have come out with green guides which are guidance on if you're going to speak to a particular type of green thing, here's what you need to have as your um, underlying uh, basis for it. And if you don't, although it's guidance, then the FTC um, will be able to, in their view, allege that you have um, conducted misrepresentation and then be able to enforce against you under federal law. And so, and they have in recent years started taking enforcement actions, which was not happening years ago. So now there's some place for people to look if they so choose. Part of the problem too is the marketing people don't always talk to the legal people before they issue uh, marketing material. Mm -hmm. But if they do, then there is very uh, clear guidelines on a lot of issues as to you know what kind of basis, scientific basis you need to have in order to say something. And, and I can tell you from my experience, I have worked with some clients that say, look, that competitor is saying this certain thing and we know that it's not true you know, in terms of their recyclable content. And so the competitors are looking at one another and they were saying, look, you know, we may go to the FTC because if they're not gonna listen to us that what they're saying is really not valid and it's hurting our market share, we'll go to the FTC because we know that the FTC is now taking enforcement action and we can make, um, uh, consumer complaints to the FTC. Maybe one more thing I'd add is I think that the businesses have become very good at marketing towards particular audiences. So I think, you know, when I take the turnpike across Pennsylvania, you'll see billboards that'll have a big piece of coal and, you know, it'll say, 
you know, cool, clean, American, and usually something else that you love, your puppies, <laughs> <laughs> something like that, right? Uh, that billboard would not probably be met with the same um, support if it was, was on 95 through Philly. So, so, and it's the same online now that you can target your messaging to audience to um, move them or keep them confused. Well, I so. meant complacency more towards like us as people. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I, I may second Joanne's. I mean, I, I think the the tension is it's hard. You, you, there's some risk in over generalizing, and I'm probably the last person to say this. Maybe on the panel because every day I'm you know lobbying against corporations that are usually trying to do the opposite of what I'm doing. But at the same time, I think you can't, uh, it, there's some risk in overgeneralizing. And I, I always live by, there's no permanent friends and no permanent enemies. And so, you know, you have to take, be critical of every one decision any individual corporation makes and are they greenwashing or not. But they may be greenwashing on one thing and then the next day they could be with you on another. And, you know, so I think you're making that point, which, you know, you, you were critically thinking of what the woman from Campbell's was telling you trying to valid, uh, you know, sort of critique the validity of it. Um, but, but it's hard to say overall there's like everybody greenwashes or nobody greenwashes or, but it's still out there for sure. I just want to add one thing, which is um, I think, you know, being somebody that's in a large institution that's trying to do the right thing and we're trying to, to kind of affect change positively, um, you do see the complexity of, of what you're doing and, and how complex it is at the, the basic level. Um, sometimes and, and then that gets pushed up and it gets distilled out into you know a, a, a line or a paragraph and then that gets a sound bite and then that gets a tweet um, on a designer news kind of or you know, as they say basically whatever news channel you you prefer to listen to um, or you prefer to, uh, to to watch and um so I, I think part of that is is our is our media as well is that um, we're not getting the core of the message because nobody wants to get down to that complex level they want the sound bite or the tweet or whatever it is. Um, and so it, it does kind of, it, it, you've, we've diminished the message, we've diminished the, the project. And, and a lot of times we've lost what's actually, was the talking point. I can't tell you how many times we've written something and then it comes back from the press office and it's like, no, we said that particularly this way because we can't say that other thing. But, um, and then, you know, whoever it is is reading that talking point, says it the way that we didn't meet anyway, um, and that that gets run in the news, or, or you know, and, and I, I don't have a particular instance of that. So, I, um, but it, but it is um, it, it is you know this stuff is complex at it at, at kind of a base level sometimes, and and when we sort of are looking for you know 140 characters to get that information, it, it really diminishes it sometimes. Real quick, is uh, is bamboo a green material? If you have bamboo floors in your house, is that green? Is that sustainable? If you have a towel made with bamboo. It's not sustainable, it's basically rayon. But there's a point where you do so much processing for material that it becomes something that's disastrous for the environment. So one of the things that we're hoping that you all will do in your careers is have the critical thinking and never present an array of solutions that are sustainable because each client's different and the context shifts every time. And if you can't dance around and understand where the sustainability targets need to be for those particular ones, you won't be a good sustainability consultant. So you have to, Think about that very critically. That was a terrible answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. So we're, we're actually we're running out of time. Oh, no. um, three, three, it's 11.13. Wow. I think folks probably have 11.30 classes. Oh. So we, we, we do have 11.30 classes. Probably okay. take maybe so five more, more minutes, but then probably have okay. folks go. We'll take one more question. Whoever puts their hand up highest. Whoever wants to go. All right. <laughs> this this, this and death matches would solve all the world's problems. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously. <laughs> But, uh, sorry if I put your name, but uh, Mr. Akaloko mentioned the importance of uh, political figures in the fight for sustainability. And next year is going to be the 2016 presidential election. So a lot of people are going to declare their bid for um, the presidency, like uh, se um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Senator Kentucky Ron Paul, Senator of Texas Ted Cruz, and stuff like that. Is there a nominee that's like has like specially good track record for um, sustainability? 
gonna be kind of Am I gonna get stuck with? It's <laughs> <laughs> the one guy who like runs a pack and does endorsements. I gotta feel just like uh, this is not a softball pitch. Uh, um, uh, partisanship aside, I mean, I, I think people would have to argue on substance that probably the folks who are in the race or moving towards the race, uh, Hillary Clinton's probably the best. I mean, there's a couple other Democrats who are sort of toying with getting in, but I don't think anyone really seriously believes they will get in uh, or can get very far. I think the challenge is um, that the gap is fairly wide. Um, you know, we were talking about this earlier that um, you have a number of candidates who are running and still, you know, very openly saying that they are not convinced that the science on climate is real. So, so when you have people saying that, that like you're not really even having a conversation about sustainability when people can't acknowledge the, what's the largest threat to the planet. So, um, you know, but but a lot of things can change in the next, um, you know, uh, 18 months, and I don't know, maybe. Hillary Clinton will come out and say the world's flat and climate change isn't real and smoking is good for you. You know what would be interesting about Hillary is we would have the first gentleman of the U.S. being Bill Clinton, and Clinton Climate Initiative is one of the premier organizations in our space right now. So if we're looking at like the partner effect here, because usually the first lady has like some offshoot job to do, so I would imagine that would be Bill's battle cry. There you go. You know, so that, that bodes well for her. Um, I do want to just say, though, more important, in my opinion, is who you pick at your local government level, in your school boards, in your uh, state government, um, your Congress representatives. Like, those are the people, you know, the president sets the tone, but it's all those other layers of government that set the course of the nation, and the president just kind of moves in between it. So I would say pay more attention to all of your local um, voting opportunities and make sure you're getting the right people in place. Watch out for O'Malley from Maryland. He's got a real platform that's pretty clearly identified as sustainable. I don't know how he is on other issues, but he's pretty effective. I've seen him on the Sunday morning. He's pretty much declared at this point without declaring. So I think that Hillary needs a challenger. She really does, because otherwise the hubris is going to do her in. It, it cost her with Obama. She got overconfident. And she lost. So I'm worried that without a good challenger to keep her sharp, she's going to start taking things for granted again, and she's going to mess up, and that would probably be bad. Yeah. No, I can't. I can't touch this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for our panel. Um, before you leave, we do have a few service announcements. Um, uh, Earth Day, Earth Week is not over yet. Um, you can see our posters in the back. We have a couple more events coming up uh, this afternoon. It's not on the board, but we are going to have solar oven cooked s'mores. Um, I think I said that right. Um, I think there will be s'mores on the Oreo this afternoon, which I feel like is the most important message there. Um, yeah, so, so if you're hungry uh, in the afternoon in between uh, studying, you should check that out. At 4.30, uh, the Climate March, uh, sponsored by the CRS group on campus, will be starting uh, at Core Hall, and we'll be marching around campus and listening to a number of guest speakers. It should be a really wonderful event. Um, I hope you can come out and bring a jacket. It seems like it's going to be a little cold. On Friday, or not on Friday, on Saturday, we have our Earth Day of Service. Uh, if you have not signed up and you would like to sign up, we have four service sites doing lots of sustainable, fun things, get your hands dirty. Um, please see me afterwards. We're going to be assigning uh, those groups uh, right after this, so uh, let me know uh, before you leave. And then last but not least, um, yesterday we released, the Villanova released our annual report for 2014, so our sustainability annual report. Uh, so if you would like to see that and see what Villanova's been up to, uh, we added a lot more graphics fun pictures this time, so um, if nothing else, it's a good scroll through. Uh, but I hope you all actually read it as well. So uh, thank you, and thank you again to our panelists. Give them a round of applause.